Tatra Mountains of Poland. The Petorek family have worked the land for generations. The hillside farm is small, the farming equipment primitive. But the land is good land, they work it hard, and Joseph Petarch hopes to pass his land on to his children. His children may or may not own this farm someday. Poland is ruled by a communist government. Thus, the future for most farm families is uncertain. In time, perhaps next year, perhaps not for five years, their way of life may be greatly changed. But now the family lives and works together, just as they have for many generations. The children must help, the old people must help. For these mountain farms are small and produce little food. The Petorek family is more fortunate than most Poles. Two terrible wars, which destroyed so many Polish towns and cities, passed their isolated village by. Evening is homework time. Respect for education is traditional in Poland. Anya, a good student, may someday go to a university, completely at government expense. Joseph Petarek's farm produces little cash income. To earn extra money, he decorates climbing hatchets, which he sells to vacationers who come to the Tatra Mountains. Saturday, but in Poland, Saturdays are school days too. Andrew and Anya go to school in the nearby village of Bukovina. Every morning, they walk more than a mile down through the meadows to the village. On the way, they pass one of the religious shrines which are to be found everywhere. Although the communist government discourages religion, most Poles are devout Catholics, the cross is everywhere, and Poland is the only communist country where, for the time being at least, religious teaching is allowed in the state schools. Aside from religious education, however, the education of Polish children is strictly supervised by the state. Today, the class is studying geography, an important factor in Poland's troubled history. The teacher has asked Anya to point out Poland's neighbor to the south, Czechoslovakia. To the south, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, all communist-ruled countries. On the east, the Soviet Union, and on the west, eastern Germany, also a communist state. Poland, after World War II, found itself surrounded by communist or communist-dominated nations. Poland, most Poles themselves say, had no choice. Circumstances made it part of that group of nations whose leader was the Soviet Union. It was a victim once again of its geographic position, which for centuries past had made it a battleground. Polish cities were often besieged and were originally built as fortresses 
like the ancient city of Krakow. In the heart of Krakow is the castle called the Wawel. Here lived the kings who reigned during the 16th century, Poland's golden age. Poland's greatest king was Stefan Bartery, who defeated the armies of the Russian Tsar, Ivan the Terrible. In this painting, he proudly accepts the Russian surrender. During Stefan's reign, Poland was one of the great powers of the world. Poles do not forget this. Their patriotism, their pride in Poland as a nation is intense and bound up with centuries of tradition. Reminders of history are to be found everywhere in Krakow. In this street lived a man remembered by both Poles and Americans, Tadeusz Kosciuszko, one of Washington's generals and a fighter for Polish independence. For centuries now, Krakow has been a busy manufacturing center. Here, a Polish export is made. Christmas tree ornaments. Like many other Polish exports, Christmas tree ornaments require little machinery and raw materials, but much skill and a great deal of hand labor. These women are state employees. In Poland, as in other communist ruled countries, private ownership of factories is not allowed. Communists believe that all industry should be government owned and operated. But in Poland, for the time being at least, there is some small scale private enterprise. However, the future for skilled craftsmen like these men is very uncertain. The communist government considers the work they do economically unimportant. Most Poles now work in mills and factories which are state-owned and managed. Here, near Krakow, is Poland's largest steelworks, named after Vladimir Lenin, a hero of the Russian Revolution. Built by the Russians with Polish labor, most of the finished steel from this huge mill is exported, chiefly to the Soviet Union. Most Poles admit that, like it or not, their economic life is dependent on the Soviet Union, their giant neighbor to the east. To house the steel workers, a new city was built. 25,000 men with their families live here. Among them, the family of steel worker Kazimir Slavetsky. Mrs. Slavetska has come out for the day's marketing at the nearby state-run food store. The food shops are usually crowded. Workers' wives do not have refrigerators, so they must shop every day. Prices are high. The Slavetskys must spend nearly half their income on food alone. Steel workers, however, are more highly paid than most other workers in Poland and the rents which they pay in this new steel town are very low. However, they get very little space for the rent they do pay. The Slovetskis, for example, share a kitchen with two other families and have, in addition, two small rooms. But they consider themselves lucky. Most Polish families must live in one room. The newspaper which Casimir reads is state-controlled. Zenik Slavetsky is a student at the Superior School, where his subjects are largely math and the sciences. Someday he hopes to be an engineer. But now he has other things on his mind.
Translated, The Lenin House of Culture. Lenin is a hero to Russian children and the Russians hope to Polish children as well. But tonight, Zenik and his friends have other heroes. They have come to this communist youth center to see a puppet show on television. Silesia is Poland's leading industrial area. Here are its large factories, chemical plants, and its zinc and coal mines. Upper Silesia, with its mines and factories, was once German. Part of it became Polish after World War I, and the rest after World War II. Its modern coal mines, like this one, contribute to Poland's industrial might. However, the West German government does not recognize Polish rights to this rich industrial area. And if you were to ask these Polish miners, they would probably say that Poland has one guarantee that the area will remain Polish. That guarantee, Poland's military alliance with the Soviet Union. Coal is an important Polish export, and most of it goes to the Soviet Union. From Silesia, it moves by rail to the major Baltic seaports, Gdansk and Gdynia. The new port of Gdynia is as modern as any to be seen in America. Conveyors transfer the coal from railroad cars directly into the ship's hold. In exchange for coal, this Swedish ship brings iron ore. Iron ore for the open hearth furnaces of the great steel town, Nova Huta. Since the war, Poland's economy has been geared to the production of exports. Since the war, too, Poland has concentrated on heavy industry, steel, machinery, industrial installations. As a result, it has produced few consumer goods, few things which Poles themselves can buy or use. There are shortages of everything in Poland. Yet Poland tries each year to increase her exports. Still, her imports far outweigh her exports. Besides iron ore, she must buy machinery, chemicals, wool and cotton, and even foodstuffs. Poland, once one of Europe's major granaries, has a serious farm problem. One of its problems is lack of machinery and modern farming methods. Over half of Poland's population live and work on farms, and yet it cannot grow enough food to feed the other half, in spite of long hours of strenuous labor. The communist government has two long-range farm programs, state farms and collective farms. On state farms, the land is owned by the state and farm workers work for wages, like factory workers. On collective farms, the farmers pool their resources. Land, farm machinery, labor. The system is based on the Russian collective farm, but so far, it has not worked well in Poland. 
in spite of all efforts of government representatives to persuade farmers to form collectives. The average Polish farmer wants to own and work his own land. In other things too, the Polish peasant has clung to the old traditional ways. Before the war, farm villages of Western Poland were bright and cheerful. Today, in many villages, the colors are returning to the homes of the small farmers. From Western Poland, the flat country stretches unbroken, past Warsaw, on to the very different looking villages along the borders of the Soviet Union. The eastern border of Poland has swung back and forth in the course of history. Hardly a generation has passed that the people of this village have not known the tragedy of war in their own backyards. The men of the village work in the nearby forests. Once this forest was the property of a Polish nobleman, and these villagers worked on the nobleman's estate. Now they do the same work, but they are state employees. Warsaw, the capital, has long been called the Paris of the East. And even today, it is closer in many ways to the West than to Russia. <laughs> Officially, American jazz is frowned on in communist-ruled nations, but is very popular with the young people of Poland. Visitors to Poland report that Polish students are curious about everything American. Our music, our homes and cities, our poets and novelists. They were born during the war. Some of them have had their families lost, their homes destroyed. Perhaps no city in history was more thoroughly destroyed than Warsaw in the last war. Much of it is still in ruins. Housing is still tragically inadequate. Yet here, from a newsreel shot, is what happened immediately after the war. Living in cellars and tents, the people of Warsaw rebuilt, first of all, the old city, the centuries-old buildings, exactly as they were before the Nazi invasion. To the people of Poland, young and old alike, reconstructed Warsaw is a source of great national pride. By such means as this, Polish children are made to feel proud of their national heritage. And yet, at the same time, these children are growing up in a country dominated by communism. The communist leaders of Poland hope to train them to believe in communism, just as they hope to convince the young people at Poland's universities. The University of Warsaw is one of the best in Central Europe. At the present time, according to reports, students and professors can say, more or less, what they believe. As one observer puts it, there is freedom of conversation in Poland, but not freedom of speech or freedom of the press. The University of Warsaw ranks high in science training. To its lecture halls come students from all over the communist world. Here, in the universities and scientific laboratories, say Polish leaders, is the future of Poland 
as a communist nation. The scars of the past are still visible in Poland. And the future of Poland is uncertain. As a nation, it faces great and perplexing problems. What the people of Poland will do about their problems will be watched with great interest everywhere in our changing world.